Hello class, welcome back to um, Philosophy 1301, Introduction to Philosophy. We're doing Chapter 2, the Pre-Socratics and the Sophist. So let's begin. Uh, well, before I begin, let me see that. Let me kind of give you like the timeline of Western philosophy thus far. So right now we're talking about the Pre-Socratics and the Sophists. So this is what we call ancient philosophy. All right, this is your first part of your uh, course content, ancient philosophy part. Uh, that runs the years uh, 1500 BCE, so 1500 years before year one. So 1500 BCE, BCE means uh, before the common era. Uh, if you're a religious person, you probably use the word BC, which means refers to before Christ. Um, but in academia, uh, as scholars, they rather use BCE to be more neutral, to stay away from the religious uh, implications of using BC. So BCE just means before the common era. This right now, from year one all the way to 2020, 2021, coming soon, that's the common era right? in big geological terms, I guess. So ancient, the ancient period, ancient philosophy, ranges from 1500 BCE Begins really with Thales, which we'll begin with him right now, right now in the moment. 1500 BCE, all the way to, the book has it to year one. But I extended ancient philosophy from 1500 BCE to about 500 um, CE, the common era. So about 2,000 years, 1,500, 2,000 years. Um, really, uh, it's, still, it's still a debate. There's no like straight consensus of when the medieval period starts. Um, I like, um, <clears throat> you know, year one, 500, around that era, that's a pretty good cutoff point. Some people use uh, specific philosophers to demarcate the difference between medieval and ancient um, philosophy. For example, uh, your textbook here uses Hypatia She's a woman philosopher, uh, but she's actually Hellenic. Not Greek, but she's Hellenic. Um, whereas some other philosophers use St. Anselm or uh, St. Thomas Aquinas to initiate the medieval period. But regardless, between the year one and about 500 CE, that's like the cutoff point between ancient and medieval. And to be clear, <clears throat> when, you hear, when you hear the word medieval, <clears throat> sorry, um, you might think about like knights and princes and lords, exciting stuff, right? You know, dungeons and castles and stuff like that, dragons, shit like that, right? But medieval just means the middle period. That's technically what it means, medieval, right? It's just the middle period. Middle between what? Ancient and modern philosophy or the modern period, all right? So we have the ancient period, or ancient philosophy, it ranges from 1500 BCE all the way between one, year one, or 500 CE. It depends on what you want to use. <clears throat> Some people use the Black, the Black Plague as a demarcation, so 349 will be a, a good cutoff point. Really depends on how you want to look at these things. But from then on, the medieval period, all the way up to, uh, I just want to say, 1500, the Renaissance, 1600s, the Scientific Revolution. That's when the modern period begins. <clears throat> so, yes, uh, Francis Bacon, right, when the Scientific Revolution initiates, or we're, get, we're getting rid of our beliefs in Christianity to explain the world to science. This is the Scientific Revolution, right? This is the Renaissance. Uh, <clears throat> Francis Bacon is a good philosopher to use as a cutoff kind of point there. So about 1560, 1500, right? Da Vinci, Michelangelo, all those great Renaissance masters. And the modern period runs all the way up to the 1800s. So from 1500 to about 1900, that's the cutoff kind of point. So the 20th century. All right, when you think about modern, you think about like maybe like the 60s or the 50s, right? 70s. But in humanities, in philosophy, history, et cetera, anthropology, 
when we talk about the modern period, we're talking about this specific period here from the Renaissance all the way up to the end of the 20th century. So from 1500 to 1900. That's the modern period. Now, the contemporary period, the period that we live in right now, the contemporary period is from 1900, or some people use uh, the events of World War I, so 1911, right, all the way up to now as a contemporary period. Right. But there's different periods that we break up into philosophy, right? the ancient, the medieval, the modern, the contemporary. Right? And this is in your textbook. This is the, the, the back, in the back flaps of the of the cover pages. Um, so, <clears throat> so let's begin with chapter two. So we're in ancient philosophy. This is the beginning of Western philosophy. This is not to say that people have not thought about these questions before. Ask why? Why does the world exist? Why do I exist? Right? What's my purpose? Why do stars exist? Why does the sun exist? Why is there earth? Why is there water? Why is why is there fire? Right? People have thought about these questions since the dawn of time. But in 500, or about, no, yeah, about 500, let me say, let me give you an exact date. There's, there's, there's no exact date, because all we have is fragments from, from Thales. But also man was around circa six, say five, 560, around 560, 570, Thales was beginning to be known as a very well-known thinker. We didn't have the word philosopher yet back then. So philosophy in the Western tradition begins in the 6th century BCE. So when I say 6th century, there's the years between 600 BCE all the way up to um, 501 BCE, 500. Uh, when you say the 19th century, we're talking about 1800 to 1900. Right? So just get that clear when we refer to centuries. Right? So the 6th century BCE is from 500 BCE back to 600 BCE. 100 years span. There. That's the beginning of Western philosophy. And if we want to pinpoint it to a person, it's going to be Thales. And why is this important? Why is this like the, a breaking point? Right? I just said people are thinking about the same questions. But the method that these pre-Socratics introduced differs tremendously from what was used to. Right? So before Thales, before uh, Heraclitus and Democritus and Anaximander and Cenos and all these people we're going to talk about right now, before these individuals in Greek and Ionia, which is present-day Turkey now, the Mediterranean world. That's where we're at right now, the Mediterranean, <clears throat> the Mediterranean Sea. Um, people are used to uh, understand the world via, in, in Greek, it would be like epics, like the epic of, right, the epics of Homer, right? So you have the Iliad, or you have the Odyssey, right? and you have these uh, great epics, right? these long fucking poems that have some tremendous uh, stories about the Cyclops and uh, <clears throat> what's the other monsters around there with the two islands and you gotta go right in the middle and you can cut up between I can't believe I'm nah, the book right behind me too um, but anyways right these these epic poems were the how you understood the world right this is what will give you the the guidelines the morality the ethics right this is how uh, don't sail beyond those islands or you'll get lost, right? And that's how you understood the world via these, these epics or these myths and right? mythology. Right? In humanities and history, in philosophy, this is what we call the mythopoeic. Let me see if I could write in this thing. Uh, okay, I'm writing with my pad here, so it's going to be shitty. Oh, I could text. Mytho. Poetic. The myth of poetic. That's how we understood the, the, our world, the universe, and our meaning in it, right? We have these myths and we have these long epic poems, right? The mythopoeic uh, understanding of the world. 
this was prior to Thales and to pre-Socratics, right? We understood the world via these myths, right? via tradition, right? via mythologies, right? via these poems by these birds, right? These Homer and stuff, and these theater and stuff like that. When Thales came around, and when Heraclitus and Parmenides and Anaximander and Anaximenes, all these people here, they uh, didn't they didn't depend on mythos, on the mythical egg. They didn't depend on mythology to understand the world around them. They depended on what we would call the logos, logic, and reason, right? Natural explanations of, of the world around you. Instead of explaining uh, thunder and rain as Zeus throwing lightning towards you because you did something wrong, we didn't sacrifice enough uh, calves or whatever, or goats. So now Zeus is mad, so he's flooding us with a lot of rain and thunder and lightning. Now these people, the pre-Socratics are like, no, dude, that's, that's stupid. <laughs> um, it's like, it's water, right? It's, got, it's, some, it's, it's like natural, right? It's not God, it's not deities, right? So think about it back then, right, in ancient Greece, right? You had to get into their minds back then, right? You got to step back. Uh, and take a more historical look at this, right? Because right now we are, most of us are <clears throat> in the U.S. at least, right? Or in the Western world, in tune to the, the uh, one sacred book, right? The Bible, or if you're like, uh, if you practice Judaism, it will be the Torah, or if you practice uh, Islam, it will be the Quran. But it's like one definite, authoritative book, right? The book where you get the Ten Commandments. Right, where you get the truth, right, where you're growing up. It's one book. In ancient Greece, they didn't believe in just one God, right? It wasn't monotheistic, right? It was polytheistic or oh, pantheistic, where it's one God, Zeus, and then a lot of other, other lesser gods. So there, there wasn't just one book that gave you all the pantheon. There was multiple sources to find out what the gods did and what the gods want. So you have you know, different writers back then. Um, Days and Nights is the name of the book. I um, forgot the name of the author. I can't believe I'm blanking out. It's too early for me right now. Um, and that's where you get like the, the mythology of things, of ancient Greece. Homer, you also get some mythology there, right? So you get different, you have different sources, different books that gave you guidance to tell you what the gods want you to do, how to comport yourself. It wasn't like just one Bible. Right? It's polytheistic, right? It's just... So <clears throat> these people are like, no, don't don't depend on these stories, on these myths, or these pre-Socratics. Depend on your reasoning alone. Just think about what's going on. Rain, thunder, and lightning. Right? It's not God being mad at us. It's just, it's the season. Right? It's kind of happens all the time in July and August, right? So if you think about it, guys, like this is this, this is seasonal, right? When it snows, it also comes in seasons, right? It comes in a pattern. So let's think about this pattern, guys, and let's, let's, let's think about this. For an example, Thales, so the first person, right? So let's... Basically, what we're doing here is like let's re let reason and experience guide you in discovering how the world is made up, instead of letting tradition and mythology, this mythical egg perspective, guide you in understanding the world. Now these pre-Socratics are introducing the application of reason and experience to guide us through understanding the world, analyzing the world. Now. Right, through natural means, not through deities and gods. Now, just reason and experience, natural phenomena. Right. <clears throat> right so, for example, Thales, right, with reason and experience, he was able to predict an eclipse, a solar eclipse. And it totally fucking confounded, right, dumbfounded the people. And where was he from? Um, Miletus in Ionia. Right. So, Thales of Miletus. Right, so in the city, in the, which is now present-day Turkey, 
off the coast of the Mediterranean, right? People used to like see a solar eclipse and freak the fuck out. It's like, holy shit, the sun is blanking out, right? It's going black. What's going on, right? Zeus or somebody is super pissed at us. Day turns into night. What's going on, right? And Thales was like, yeah, chill, guys. Like, chill. I got this. It's math. It's reason. Experience, right? And he actually predicted it, right, in a couple of months in, in advance when exactly a solar eclipse was going to happen. And that just blew people's fucking minds, right? And he became super, he became like a rock star, Thales, right? Just on reason and experience alone, applying this. So his method, right, of using this, right, of using this, uh, of predicting the solar eclipse without appeal to the divine, without any appeals to deities or gods, was tremendously transformative for the Western world. So that's where we credit Thales as the first philosopher. <clears throat> right? Because he, he stops using gods and myths to understand the world and uses, I guess, observations, right? Empirical data, right? Science, I want to say, right? The first scientist, the first philosopher is Thales. So this was in 585 BCE when he predicted that solar eclipse. I'm telling you, people were fucking freaking out, right? They were like, how'd you do this, Thales? And then he was so smart, right? He was like, yeah, uh, there's going to be storms during these months, the monsoon months, right? So I'm not going to sail out to sea and try to fish, right? Or try to, you know. Um, so he would use the seasons for his own advantage, economic advantage. So he became filthy rich, Thales, by using reason and experience, he was just able to uh, take advantage of seasons to grow, what was it, olive trees, right? And then he had a monopoly of the olive uh, business in Miletus, in Ionia, right? And olive oil was super uh, coveted around the Mediterranean and beyond the Mediterranean world. So he made a fucking banking out of just realizing when to drop a seed for the olive tree and when to uh, harvest it and when to press the olives, right? Just on um, using not tradition as they used to before. Oh, well, you know, it's raining. Uh, we should plant it now before it stops raining. It's like, no, 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 just seasons, guys. You gotta think about this. Use experience, right? Think about what happened last year and last year before that and that. And Thales, right, applied this, not just to become the first philosopher and the first scientist, but become filthy rich. So you want to ask me why you want to study philosophy? You know, it might help you get rich, just like Thales. All right. So, right, so Thales, so the method, right? Looking at the world, understanding the world in natural means, instead of de uh, depending on gods and deities, on the divine. Now I'm going to understand, drop that bogus, ho hocus pocus stuff and look at the world as it is, right? with reason and experience. I cannot ever emphasize those two words, reason and experience. We're going to come back to haunt us for the rest of the term. So his method, right, applying this method, right, it's this, I don't even want to call it scientific method, right? This is a prototypical scientific method being born here in around 500 BCE, or 585 BCE, to be more exact, with Thales. Um, another interesting thing about Thales is that he believed that the world, so everything could be explained by phenomena, right, by elements. So before Thales, uh, some Greeks that were more um, guess scientifically minded believed that the world, was, the universe was made up, or the world was made up of four elements, right, earth, water, fire, what's the other fucking one? Air, earth, fire, air, water. Right? Earth, wind. It's, it's a band, right? I, I should have named the band Earth, Wind, Fire, Water, whatever. Right? There's four elements: Earth, Air, Fire, and Water. There you go. In the street. Uh, and he believed so that was even the, the Greeks had before Thales. It was the four elements mixing together, or I don't know how, right? Co combining together to create, right? or each one in its own separate things, right? But Thales thought 
that the fundamental, right, the most fundamental element that makes up the rest of the other stuff in the world is water. He held that water was the source of everything that exists. And this is what the pre-Socratics were really, really um, obsessed with, with this question and trying to find out what is the fundamental element? What is, what is the fundamental stuff, material stuff that the earth is made out of? Right? There's all this crazy stuff in the world, right? Trees and birds, humans, dogs and cats. Right. Roaches, rats, whatever. What is the fun, what what is the source of all that life? That was like the main preoccupation with these people. And like I said, this main this question, right, was not new, right? It's just the method, right? The methodology that these pre-Socratics are using, that's new and revolutionary. Right. Now we're not applying gods again, right? We're using the method of reason and experience to make sense to answer that question of what is the earth fundamentally made out of. Thales, it was water. Water is the source of all things. So maybe he, um, and it kind of makes sense, right? Think about this, right? Just with experience and reason, right? Just, just your experience with water, right? You guys ever been, um, you know, Water, right? Without we're eighty percent water, right? Apparently, we know that now. If you don't drink water, I mean, you're gonna die of thirst, right? You gotta drink water, right? If water you do is drink soda or something with sugar, your teeth are gonna fall out, right? If water is so essential to life, right? And I guess you just notice that, right? Just via experience and reason, like shit, everything needs water, right? Animals need water, plants need water, everything needs fucking water. So that must, that should be the source of life. Or maybe he saw, right, just with reason and experience, right, dailies, that water turns into different states, right? It's liquid, but if it's cold enough, it turns into solid. Or if it's hot enough, it turns into air, right, vapor, right? And in boils, right, it's it's it has it has that potential to turn into different kind of different states of being. So maybe Thales was like, well, that makes sense. Maybe that's why it's that should be water makes sense to be the source of life. Right? So what I'm getting at is just he was just looking at things as they are. He was not depending on Homer or Let's see what I have this guy right here real quick. Man, I need to. He's the other. There you go. Uh, sorry guys. I gotta do this. So I'm talking about these people here. Okay? So we had Hesiod, right? Theodonis. So Hesiod is one of the main ones that um, the source of Greek mythology back then and today. Right? He, he talks about all the gods, even before Zeus. He talks about the dad of Zeus and how Zeus came around, Kronos, and crazy stories, right? Um, World in days, Theogony. That's the one that I'm getting at. He's the art, the art in it. Read it. It's fantastic to read. It's not too. It's not too long. It's really short. It's about 60 pages or so, uh, and it's all about ancient Greek mythology. So you want to get the source of Greek mythology? It's Hesiod. Right? <clears throat> so uh, all these people, Homer, right, the Odyssey. Gods, right? Gods control water, right? There's a god of water, right? Is it? I mean, you've seen uh, Trident, right? We've seen the Little Mermaid. <laughs> Trident, right? The god of the king of the underworld, of the undersea, right? There's a god of fire, right? There's a god of everything. There's gods for everything, right? And that explains every natural phenomenon. That explains earthquakes. That explains lightning. That explains flooding. That explains rain, right? And Thales was like, nah. That's not the way to go. Right? Those are the right questions, but not the right method. Okay? So for him, is water, right? Water seems so important, right? The fundamental uh, primary source of all existence is water for tables. Right? 
it seems so important for all material processes that it has to be the source of life. And after Thales, we have his student, Anaximander, followed in his footsteps of his teacher, right? Also uh, discarded with Hesiod and Homer and these, these uh, mythopoeic ways of understanding the world and applied natural explanations, right? Reason and experience to understand and analyze the world around him. So he's also uh, so from Miletus, from Ionia, from present-day Turkey. Um, but what's important about Anaximander, what makes him distinct from his teacher, Thales, is that he, instead of water or fire or earth, right? So for example, another uh, student, Anaximenes, almost the same as, as Anaximander, they were both students, I think, uh, he believed it was air, the main source of all life, the fundamental element of the world. And Anaximander, instead of an element like fire, water, air, or earth, instead claimed it was this thing called the Iperion. Let me write that down. The Iperion. Iperion, I guess, I don't know, I'm making that pronouncement. The Iperion, the boundless, the infinite. That's the answer of everything. That's the source of everything. This formless, imperishable uh, substance called the Aperion. And this boundless and in indefinite, infinite thing that makes other things happen. Okay? It's the beginning of all. It's always existed. And never, and it's never going to perish. It's never going to die. Uh, it doesn't have really the beginning, but it's always been there. It's this Aperion force, substance, kind of like want to make my, <laughs> yeah, that's the Aperion, right? Um, that's what supports everything else, right? So for an Aximander, for example, it was water. I mean, for, for Thales, it was water, the, the fundamental element that creates all of life. But what supports water? What is the thing that supports water? What gives rice water, <laughs> right? Uh, so they're trying to get away from God, so they can't go, oh, it's God, right? They're trying to get away from that explanations. And this guy comes away like, what's well, this thing called the Aperion, right? It's this, this big, indefinite, just substance that makes up everything, right? A little bit abstract here. That's what Anaximander came up with. Um, another thing that he's really important for, for, for our purposes of our introduction class here, is that he always, um, just like most Greeks did though, but he really laid this out and kind of more developed it more elaborately, is that he realized that the world exists in these pairs of dialectic, of opposites, night and day, right? hot and cold, Uh, you could think about many endless, right? Wet and dry, right? of these pairs, right? Of these dialectics, right? Of these, these pairs of opposites, right? And he thinks that this is um, this is what makes existence grow. So we have the aperion, right? This boundless, indefinite, imperishable source of things, and the way things come about from this aperion is via this constant war, struggle of opposites and things come about. It's an ex-commander. Wonder what the fuck he was drinking. <clears throat> but anyways, that's just like two of his main kind of like ideas. Right? There's this this the Aperion and this 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 dialectic, this this opposite forces that give birth to life. So everything around us is run by these two main things here. All right. Um, And this Hyperion is like, right, it's indefinite. It doesn't move, it's just there, right? It's like in the middle, right? So if it doesn't move, it doesn't go forward, it doesn't go back, it's just there. It's always been there, always be there, it's just there, right? We can't really see it and stuff, 
until it's embodied into like a person or a book or a plant or whatever. But that's like the source of existence. It's a fundamental element for an Aximander is the Imperium. And then you, then you have these opposite forces that create everything around us. Okay. Oh, and, and if you guys want to find out what we're talking about, on page 36 of the textbook, there's a, a nice little uh, map of the Greek world. So let's see where we're at over here. So over here, this is what we're talking about right now, Miletus, uh, Ionia, present-day Turkey. Over here is the Greek Isles. So you have Sparta. Athens somewhere over here. Attica. So that's where we're at over here. Okay? This is the world that we're talking about right now. Right? The Mediterranean world around 500 to uh, year one. 500 BCE to year one. All right, let's talk. About, let's move on to the next one, next Presocratic. Uh, so let's move on away from the millet, millennium, uh, the, the from Miletus, uh, from the Ionian. Pre-Socratics, I'm sorry, that's what I want to say, from the Ionian pre-Socratics, because they come from that part of the Mediterranean world, Ionia. And let's move on to uh, to another one, Heraclitus. Um, this guy is from a different city, north of Miletus, uh, not too far, right? Uh, Ephesus. So these guys are known as the Ionian pre-Socratics. Um, Thales, Anaximander, Anaximenes, uh, Heraclitus, and there's many more, but that's the ones that we're going to talk about in this book for, so far. So these are the Ionians, Socratics. Right? So when you hear in architecture, right, the Ionian column, because it comes from this area, right, which is now Ionia, is present day Turkey, right? what we call today Turkey. All right, uh, let's move on. Heraclitus. Uh, around 500 BCE, right before the Common Era. Um, this guy, Heraclitus, his, his, his central idea is the logos. Logos. So now we have this word that comes into our, our vocabulary, into our lexicon, the logos. What is the logos? So the logo is not a logo. Right, like you know, like different um, brands have logos. Right, hell, a is a logo for a nation. Right, each nation has its own logo. Right, uh, no, that's not what we're talking about. Here we're talking about logos, right, with the S. Okay, so logos, uh, according to, for Heraclitus, is this this law or this principle or this this, this order of the world. Right, it's this this this, this thing. This this that controls and runs the world. It's the logos. Right? That's in Eastern philosophy, which we'll talk about in chapter six. This is known like karma, right? The the, the force that regulates the universe. In Western philosophy, we call it the logos. This is like the the principle or the formula, or the law that orders, that controls the way the world works. Right? Logos. Um, and I move like this a lot, right? <laughs> uh, because he thinks, this guy, Heraclitus, that everything is in flux. Um, this is one of his quotes. Most of these uh, pre Socratics will only have fragments or words taken from other philosophers that have studied them. Most of their original works are just lost to history or just little small fragments, right? So for Heraclitus, for example, we have. A little bit of epigrams, short little clever little snippets, and then very little. Although he wrote a lot, right? And he was highly influential. We just have a little bit of snippets here and there, fragments. The rest that's filled in, the information that we have about these people is via other philosophers like Plato or Aristotle that talked about these pre Socratics. Right? So you could argue that we really don't know who these people are because we really don't have direct evidence from their time period. Right? Small little fragments, that's it, right? and archaeological evidence. So it's still, you know, this, this area is still very alive in debate of who they really were, who was these people, who were these people. 
anyways, Heraclitus, right? The logos, right? Everything's in flux. This is one of his, uh, his fragments. All are in flux like a river. All are in flux like a river. And this been um, this been interpreted or rephrased like um, like this. You cannot step twice into the same river. So all are in flux like a river, right? So think about that. You're in the river, right? Never been to the banks of the Rio Grande. This is right down the street here for me. Um, if you're not harassed by the border patrol and you want to chill there, right? You go to the banks of the Rio Grande, or go to New Mexico, where it's U.S. on both sides, right? Go towards Mesilla or whatever, and you know, go off the road a little bit and go to the banks of the Rio Grande. It's beautiful. It's majestic. Right. It's the reason why they call it the Rio Grande, the Rio Bravo, especially if you go more northern up, right, towards like Taos, right, New Mexico or something. Anyways, um, you cannot step into that same river twice. It's the same Rio Grande, the same Rio Bravo, but once you step once, you step out, you step again, it's not the same river. Why? Because the water is constantly flowing, right? It's not the same water, it's not the same even fish, right? It might be a different whole fish. Or a school of fishes that swim crass again, right? So if you go to the same river, it's not the same river. Right? Why? Because everything's in flux. And this is this idea, right? This, this logic, right? He just come. He, he thought about this, right? And he experienced a river many times. I'm, I'm sure Heraclitus, right? They live over there by where the sea is at. Uh, and he was. He thought about this, right? Experience and reason, right? Introspection and experience. He was like, you know what? Everything's moving, just like the river. That's life. And he's like, aha, this is life all around me. Everything's in flux. Everything's in moving. Everything's movement, right? But underlying this movement, this flux, right, of things, there is the sameness. Right? So think back about the Aperion, something like that, right? So there's the Aperion that doesn't move, that's indefinite. It's always there. But from there, it springs out sprouts out life for uh, anaximander it was it was in the form of these opposite forces for heraclitus right you have these logos not the apparel no more it's the logos that controls everything it's, it's always the same and from the sameness this logos comes right life what we know as life right so everything's ever changing what unifies us is what he, what he calls the one. Let's put it that way. He puts it that way, actually. Heraclitus, right? The one, right? And this is the logos itself. I hope you guys are following. This is it's pretty out there stuff. <clears throat> the sameness, the sameness that unifies all the motion that we see around us behind underlying all that motion around us i just saw a bus some metro bus by pass by that motion right underlying that motion there's the sameness right it's this logos that controls and orders the world right? i think that's pretty powerful stuff right? it really aligns really well with uh with hinduism this heraclitus guy in anaximander and I'll talk about that when we get to chapter six, though. Okay. About the Atman and the Atman and, the, and karma and moksha and stuff like that. But that's chapter six. But anyways, right, this guy, Heraclitus, just like an Eximander, right, influenced by this guy, obviously, right, all things come into opposition, right? This, 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 this flux, right, this motion, right? It is based on strife. It is... The strife and necessity that make life happen. Right? Uh, and the logos is that is what ensures this strife, right? This necessary strife to balance, to to har harmonize, right? So you have night and day, and you're fighting for supremacy, right? And then you have the logos be like, no, chill, guys, twelve hours and twelve hours. And you have night, day, night and day, right? Theoretically, right? Or you have hot and cold, right? Or you have summer, you have winter, right? And for him, right, for, for these people, it's, it's a battle. And then you have the logos to harmonize these things, right? 
Exodus, as working for, for Heraclitus. So thus, behind all this change, right, whether it's hot and cold, night and day, seasons, or whatever, us, behind underlying all this change, there is a logos, the sameness, right, the one, right, the logos. Right. And from this, right, from this moderation of the logo does in the universe, we could extrapolate how we should guide ourselves, how we should comport ourselves, i.e., in essence, ethics, right? So from this idea of the logos, we're able to extrapolate, or Heraclitus is able to extrapolate and claim how we should comport ourselves, morality and ethics, right? So since the logos steers all things, harmonizes all things, right, and it operates with this divine thought, as he says, Right? We should strive to maintain this harmony as the logo does as well. We should strive to emulate the logos in its way of harmonizing strife, of harmonizing opposite forces. Right? Moderation, he says. This is, a, this is a fragment from Heraclitus. This is in your, from your textbook here, okay? page 37. Moderation is the greatest virtue. And wisdom is to speak the truth and to act according to nature, giving heed to it. Here, nature is, of course, referring to the logos, right, to the what. So give, give heed to the logos and act according to the logos, right, in harmony, in moderation, right, moderate between two extremes, forces. Okay. So Herophilus, right, let's move on. I really get really excited about this stuff, so I can talk about forever about this. Right, you guys catch me at a bar. Well, right now, everything's bar. They're all closed down. But back in the day, you catch me at a bar. You get me drunk. I'm talking about this forever. <laughs> I love talking about this stuff. All right, let's move on to um, Empedocles. Um, I'm not sure where he's from. I should have looked that up. Anyways, I'm just going to really quickly mention Empedocles. Um, because he is uh, he's important for this reason. He um, came up with a really rudimentary um, theory of evolution. Right? So you guys heard of Charles Darwin, right? the USS Beagle, went around the world or around to South America and to the uh, Galapagos Islands. And that's where Darwin got the idea of evolution, adaptation, and natural selection, evolution, right? this modern theory of evolution. Anybody a biology, a biologist out there, you know what I'm talking about? This theory was actually around in around 495, 435 BCE, about 2,000 years ago, right? Before Charles Darwin. Pretty cool, right? And these people back then, without, you know, the instruments that Darwin has or without the science that we have today in the contemporary period, was able to come up with this idea of evolution. Granted, it's very rudimentary, very weird at that, too. Nonetheless, it still has the same kind of mechanistic idea of revolution, of things evolving. Right? So Empedocles, right, it says that animals were not created by a deity, right, by Zeus or by, by these gods, right? That's what we would think we used to. We used to think, right, that people are created by gods, right? Adam and Eve, for example, people still believe that. And Empedocles is like, no, that's not the way it happened, right? The way it happened is that we evolve from primitive forms. So this is the way that he imagined evolution, Empedocles. Right? It's totally different from Darwin, but still evolution, nonetheless. Uh, so back in the day, way, way back in the day, right, there was weird forms, weird creatures, right? There was, uh, he says, there was heads with no, with, heads with no necks, eyes with no face, uh, arms with no shoulders, and they were just running around are weird around the fucking earth until as time passed by they got together and they combined to create a human or a dog or a cow or whatever but before that each each single part was just roaming around on its own and then as evolution as time passed by it kind of perfected and the ones that worked out the combination that worked out live on right survived and pass on those traits to their offsprings, right? So natural selection, just in the weird sense where, in the weird sense, right? You guys get this? 
I hope so. All right, so the naked arms wander devoid of shoulders and eyes straight alone, begging for foreheads. Right? And then eventually they combine either to create a good one that worked out or one that didn't work out and that died off. That's Empedocles. Very similar to natural selection as Darwin viewed it, except Darwin had more sophisticated science behind it, right? So pretty cool, Empedocles, right? Ancient theory of evolution. I think I find that pretty fascinating. All right, let's move on to even more fascinating stuff. I need to get water. I'll be right back with some water. <clears throat> Actually, it's vodka. No, I'm just kidding. I wish it was vodka, but no. Too early for that. All right, let's move on to more interesting stuff. And right, well, depends on to you. If you like physics and mathematics, this guy's your man, Pythagoras. I'm sure you all heard about the Pythagorean theorem. Right, a squared plus b squared equals c squared. Right, pretty tremendous little formula there. And ever wondered who the fuck was Pythagoras or where the name came from, the Pythagorean theorem? This guy, Pythagoras, uh, was born around circa 550 BCE to 500 BCE. Um, super famous back then, tremendously influential. Even today, we still use the Pythagorean theorem. We still use a lot of his ideas, as a matter of fact. So he's from Ionia. Uh, he was actually from the small island Samos off the coast of Ionia. So he's still kind of a part of the Ionian uh, Pre-Socratics, right? But this this uh, island off the coast of Ionia, Samos, um, pretty small island. Um, beautiful if you ever have a chance to go over there. Um, Asia Minor, we call it Asia Minor now. Anyways, uh, it's actually off the coast of Italy, Samos. I'm gonna show you the map. Let me show you the map. So where it's at. Oh, this map doesn't have. Oh, you're right here. No, it doesn't have it. Anyways, so Samos off the coast of Ionia, and then he went off to Italy. So he traveled from Ionia across the Mediterranean to Italy. I'm sure Samos. Samos gotta be there in the fucking map. Oh, it is. So. So, Miletus and Samos, that island right there. And he went all across to like Italy over here somewhere. You follow the map there. Anyways, here, um, Pythagoras, fucking fascinating guy. So Pythagoras believed that numbers were the all be and all be all of the universe. The way to find out the secrets, the mysteries of the universe is via numbers. Numbers are going to give you everything you need to know about the universe. And a lot of people still think this way today, especially mathematicians, right? That you can uncover how the world works just by numbers. It's actually a really good movie that kind of talks about this concept called Pi. Jolodowski, Aaron Jolodowski is the director. And it's just like the the sign pi. It's a fantastic, creepy movie, but it's about this, about like the power of numbers, right? So they had, I mean, they didn't, they pretty much revered numbers. They were like gods to them for the Pythagoreans. So Pythagoras initiated a cult, a cult of numbers, where numbers were like their gods, really, right? They were crazy. They were really weird people, these Pythagoreans. Let me tell you some stuff about them that's fascinating. So it was all about numbers. Right. They have many, many followers. As a matter of fact, Plato was one of their followers. Right. Um, anyways, the Pythagoras, they believe in metempsychosis. Metempsychosis is basically a fancy word for reincarnation. Metempsychosis. There's no S here. It equals reincarnation. 
they believe in that because because they believe in metempsychosis that you could be reincarnated when you die. They were strictly vegetarian, very very vegetarian. Why? Because they were afraid that if we eat a chicken or a cow, right, some meat or whatever, that you might be eating one of your relatives or one of your ancestors, because you could be reincarnated as a cow or as a chicken yourself. Right? So all they ate was plants. Right? They were strictly vegan. Right? No, no animal products because they thought you could become reincarnated as an animal yourself. So it's to avoid you being eaten, you become vegan, right? Kind of, kind of weird, right? Whatever. So they believe in metempsychosis that the soul travels through different canisters or through different um, bodies, whether it's a human body form or whether it's an animal body form. The soul, nonetheless, travels. It's kind of eternal. So you gotta be careful what you eat, right? You might be eating your grandma next time you eat this delicious hamburger, according to the Pythagoras. <laughs> Um, so a strictly vegetarian diet. And then they also have little weird rules, right? little weird beliefs. For example, they didn't eat beans. Right? You believe like a vegetarian diet, beans would be essential, right? They have a lot of um, proteins and fiber, right? Um, but they didn't eat beans. Right? And it wasn't because they were afraid that they're going to eat the grandmas or nothing like that, right? Plants were okay to eat. It was just animals that were just off limits. Because it could be your cousin or your Theo or whatever. But beans were off limits as well because they resembled testicles, human male testicles. So they thought that it was bad to eat testicles, right? And also, this is a, a, even worse, a little bit funnier, I think, right? than this weird thing about this weird fear of testicles, eating testicles, um, is that they thought they were alive. These beans, right? Every other plant, right, is fine, but the beans, they're somehow alive. How? Think about this, right? These, these guys are pre-sort products, so it's experience and reason. So when you eat beans, what's your experience when you eat a lot of beans? You fart, you flatulate, right? So they're like, holy shit, when we eat beans, they're alive still because they start talking to us. <laughs> yeah, from our behinds, but these fucking beings are talking to us when we eat them, right? We are our farts, we are flatulation. <laughs> so the Pythagoras were like, yeah, we're not going to eat beans because these fuckers are alive. They talk. <laughs> I find that super hilarious. I don't know about y'all. But yeah, Pythagoras. Besides the little weird perks there, this cult was tremendously important because of the reverence numbers. So we have the Pythagorean theorem, right? We find that out. Square numbers, right? Square roots, right? They were the ones who discovered, right, how to use square roots and what square roots do, the power of square roots. And if you're a physicist or you're in civil engineering, square roots is where it's at, right? Um, what else did they find out? Um, they had Pythagoras had this beautiful idea. So I also play guitar and and um, bass. Um, so I believe, uh, I, I love music, right? And Pythagoras had this beautiful idea that it's called the music of the spheres. The music of the spheres. So the basic uh, concept here is that the planets and the stars are aligned and they move in a certain way in our galaxy, in our universe. Uh, and we could see them, right? We might not be able to pinpoint exactly what they are, but we could measure their alignment as, as the season moves around, right? As we move around the sun, whatever. Um, so people were aware of that. Uh, and we could get like ratios behind, between the distances between these spheres, right? So back then, they didn't, they didn't know there was a star or, or a planet. There were just spheres back there, out there in the sky. So the ratios of the distance between the spheres, you could create this heavenly music, right? It's the music of the spheres. And it's supposed to be like the most beautiful music ever and stuff. And so that was like their idea. And this was brought down to musical scales, right? The reason why we have musical scales and they're based on numbers, really, right? The distance between notes, right? It's one note and you skip a note and you hit another note. And you do that along, you do a scale. You have a musical scale. Ionian, Pentatonian scales, right? If you're a musician, you know this, right? And there's differences. It, it all, the scales all depend on the distance between notes. 
they, these Pythagoreans, discovered that, that the ratios, right, these, these musical ratios are the ones that give us the scales, that give us harmony, that sound good, right? So if you're a musician, you first gonna learn notes, and then you learn scales. And scales sounds really beautiful. They're the right, if you have the right, if you mess up, right, in the scale, you could tell right away that's the wrong note. You have to hit the right note. It's got to hit the right ratio of distance between notes. The Pythagoreans discovered that. It's fucking cool. I think it's fucking cool. All right. So besides our weird cultish behavior about beans and the vegetarian beliefs, they're fucking cool people. I mean, vegetarians are fucking cool people. I mean, I think we should all be vegetarians. But I do love me some fucking barbacoa tacos. They beat us. So. Anyways. That's my fault. Uh, so numbers, right? Square numbers, square roots, odd and even numbers, right? The patterns of those, the musical scales, right? They all discovered that, right? They're all about that. And we still use that today, right? Pythagorean theories are still very much alive with us today, even though they were created about 2000, more than 2,000 years ago. So, but one thing that I want to get about the Pythagoreans, though, is that And the rest of the other Pre-Socratics were so concerned, obsessed, I said, about the, the fundamental matter of the Earth, of the universe. What is the fundamental element that makes the universe exist, right? The contents, if you, if you want to put it that way, of the universe, right? This is what the Pre-Socratics were so obsessed with finding out, was the content. The Pythagoreans were obsessed with the form. It's not the content, but the form. How is the world formed? How is the world ordered? What is the form of the world? Right. Numbers, I thought, was the answer to figure that out. So geometry, astronomy, music, these were the main three things they studied. Right. Geometry. So sacred geometry. Right. You're into that stuff, sacred geometry. Right. Pythagoras would be your man to study. Besides the Eastern uh, Hindus and, and the ancient uh, Eastern philosophies, like the Babylonians and stuff. Keep in mind, these people were in contact. This is the Mediterranean world. Right, right now, I'm kind of isolating them as just Greek and Ionia. But be, be, below, the, below this map here, right, you have a whole fucking world. I mean, we're going to have Egypt back down here, way down here. You have uh, Algeria and Africa down here. And the Middle East down here, over here. Oh, I guess it's, oh, it's up and down. It's this way. Okay, so you have present-day Turkey, Constantinople, and you have the gateway to the Middle East, and then Egypt down here in the bottom. So these people were in contact with all these ideas. Right? The Mediterranean world was in flux. It's a, it's a borderland. Right? Think of what a borderland is. Right, we live right now in a borderland in El Paso, the border between El Paso and Juarez, right? Chihuahua, Texas, U.S. and Mexico. Right, and what's happening here? What's unique about El Paso, or what's different from El Paso, say, from liberal Arkansas, or liberal Kansas, or Texas, Arkansas? <laughs> I mean, think about I don't know, Paris, Texas. How is Paris, Texas different from El Paso, Texas? The fucking culture, right? Everything. There's a lot of things going on, right? So this clash is going on here, right? Sometimes it's violent, right? There's got cartels, you have the Border Patrol, right? Fucking duking it out, right? Ice and stuff. And then you have people, everyday people like me and my grandmother going back and forth to her doctor in Juarez and I bring her back to home to, in El Paso. Right? You, you know, before uh, the COVID hit, Right, choppers, right, back and forth, right, and the food here, El Paso, right. I've, I've, I don't ever think I've ever been to Paris, Texas, but I could guarantee you that the food here. Maybe I'm just biased though. There's a big ass flag back here, but uh, the food in El Paso, I'm almost bet your ass, it's way better than the food in Paris, Texas, or in liberal Kansas. Guys ever heard of liberal Kansas, huh? It's actually a pretty cool town. <laughs> um, anyways, 
right? This borderland, or we have this 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 mixture, right? This flux, this this, this strife of two cultures that bring about this unique culture here, this borderland culture. The same is happening here in Greek in this time period. You have the Greeks, right? More or less white people. And then down here, unfortunately, I don't know why the textbook does that. We have a whole world of black and brown people and the Mediterranean, they're duking it out. You have the Persian Wars, right? Never saw the movie 300. That's what it's all about here, right? So there's, there's constant flows and exchanges and interchanges of ideas, whether it's through warfare or intellectual, there's just exchanges of ideas, right? And you're gonna see a lot of influences from Egypt, from 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 India, right? Uh, from Buddhism and these pre-Socratics and Aristotle and Socrates and Plato himself right? and all these people because it, they're all connected, right? Globalization has been happening forever. Right? The world has always been interconnected. We've never been just one country isolated from each other. It's always been connected, right? And this is what these people are trying to get at here as well. So think about this 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 Mediterranean world as a borderland world where all these cultures are clashing, yet all these ideas are being exchanged and creating beautiful new ideas that are still with us today, like the logos, the Pythagorean theorem, right? Sacred geometry and stuff like that. All right, cool. Let's move on. So I get caught up with all this shit here. Uh, Parmenides, next guy. So Parmenides, uh, we know very little about his stuff. We know more about his student, Sino. All right, so Sino of Ilia. He's another Iron off Ionian coast. Um, so Parmenides, um, was a teacher of the of Sino. Uh, the reason why he's so important, Parmenides, is because he was really influential towards Plato and Socrates, even to uh, later philosophers like Hegel. Talk about it in the modern period. But he's so important because he's the first one, one of the first ones, perhaps the first one, to systematically right, use deductive reasoning for his philosophizing. Right? So prior to Parmenides, most people were using inductive reasoning, observation, and then making conclusions. This guy flips the script and uses deductive reasoning to make uh, conclusions. So you could argue that most pre-Socratics before Parmenides were mostly empiricists and not rationalists. Well, they're a little bit of both, right? They use experience and then reason, introspection, conclusion. Okay? That's what's going on here, right? Tilly's. So the seasons uses reason, his mental ca capacities, predicted the eclipse, okay? This guy, Parmenides, yeah, he used experience as well, but he depended more on reason. He emphasized the reason part. This is what he called rationality, rationalism. So rationalism is the view that some or all of our knowledge about the world comes independently from experience. It's just in our minds. We just think about things, we could figure out how the world works. That's rationalism. Whereas empiricism, right, empiricism comes from the word empirical, which means observations, right? Just experience, the E. Empiricism, all or some of your knowledge comes from experience. And then you make sense of it, right? So empiricism depends on experience. Rationalism depends on your rationality. Pretty straightforward distinction here, right? Parmenides gives us a distinction, right? And to this day, this distinction is still debated about. Where does knowledge come from? Right? This is one of the main questions of epistemology. How do we get our knowledge? Is it just reason alone? Or do I have to experience things to know things? For example, a triangle, right? Do I have to go and experience every single triangle in the world to know for certain that all triangles have three sides? Or can I just think about it and use my rationality and be like, yes, 
All triangles have three sides, right? There's two different ways of looking at how we get knowledge, rational, rationalism or empiricism. And Parmenides, he's one of the first ones to really make that distinction clear. And this distinction has been cursing us, right? Has been plaguing us philosophers since 515, 450 BCE. All right, so Parmenides, like I said, he put more emphasis on rationalism. So he's credited, he's given the name as the first rationalist philosopher. Again, by using just deductive argumentation. So deductive argumentation goes with rationalism, using your minds and coming up with conclusions. Whereas inductive argumentation goes really well with empiricism, where you gotta go and see stuff and observe stuff and experience stuff and record stuff. And then you come up with your conclusion. Right? Empiricism really is well, the, the name of the game for science, or most science. Right? Or physical science, I should say. Another dis distinction that Parmenides is important to know about is the distinction of the contrast between reality and appearance. Right? So he believed that everything that we hold to be true, right? We are just common sense. We are just inductive reasoning, right? We are just our experience. We are empirical data, our sense data, if you will, our senses, such as movement, right? Change, uh, multiplicity, diversity, uh, and our sensory qualities, right? All these things that we kind of take for granted as being just obviously real, right? It's it's obviously real that it's going to change from from hot to cold when it rains or when it snows, right? For Parmenides and then for his student, Sino, this change, this movement, right, this the multiplicity, this diversity of stuff is an illusion. It's the, an appearance. It's not really real. All these things are illusions. Uh, the only way to find out what's true, what's really real, is through reason alone. Why? Because, because we cannot trust our senses, right? I take out my glasses, and right now I don't know why my eye is bothering me so much, but I take out my glasses, and I can't see for shit. I'm blind as a bat, right? So I can't trust my senses, right? I can't say for sure, like, that the color of my couch is gray. Right? Well, I guess it is, because it's just a big gray blob, right? But if I put on my glasses, I could see the details and the texture of it now. So because of that, right, Parmenides is like, yeah, maybe everything we see and experience and touch might be just an illusion. How do we know for sure it's not real? The only way we can know for sure what's real is via our reason, right? Reasoning. Reason can reveal the truth. So let me kind of explain how Parmenides got to this fucking crazy conclusion that everything is an illusion, basically. So it goes like this, right? So change, movement, right? When something moves or when something changes, right? So when I move from here to here, right? I am no longer over here. I was there, I was here, I was this, I was that. But once I move, I no longer that thing that was there. So I'm talking about something that's not there no more. But according to Parmenides, it's impossible to talk about what is not. Because when you talk about something that's not there, something that, that what is not, um, something that cannot possibly exist, right? you talk about nothing. Right? When you talk about what is not, so I move just out of the screen, I, I cannot really talk about me being here because I'm not here. There's nothing here, right? I guess it's just the books right behind me. But there's nothing there, right? Now I'm here. Now I could talk about this. But when I was away, I cannot talk about this, right? Because it's not there. Nothing's there. It's impossible to talk about nothing. So when you talk about what is not there, you're talking about nothing. You're just talking about just nothing. And what is change then, right? Follow me here. What is change? What is movement? Going from what is to what is not to a different thing, right? 
So change suggests, right, going from what is to what is not. And that in itself is impossible, says Parmenides. Thus, he concludes that change and movement is uh, just an illusion because it's impossible. It's logically impossible. This is what we call a paradox. And when we see something changing, right, we, we're changing. And we, I can move. And, and I can talk about this movement. But he says, like, well, but when we change, logically speaking, we're talking about something that, that is to change into what is not. So right now it was, uh, I started, anyway, I started like 11 and going on forever here. Right now it's 10.55, right? I started off like at 10.15, I think, or whatever. I don't know what the fuck time I started. I lost time. Let's try to get time now. But now it changed, right? So it's not this no more. I cannot talk about what's past. I cannot talk about what's not. Right? So that's why change is not possible, logically possible. So it has to be an illusion. Um, if you want to get more into this, I strongly suggest you to YouTube, right? See no paradoxes. So go to YouTube and put Zeno's paradoxes. And you have a little bit of in your textbook, right? So it's Zeno's paradoxes, C E N O's paradoxes. To so understand this, this view here that everything is an illusion. Pretty controversial stuff here, I must say. So if everything is an illusion, so how do we know about, how do we make sense of the universe? Again, he also believes in the, the one, as Heraclitus did. Right? He has this thing, the one, that kind of supports everything else, even though, but to get to that one, we need to use reason to break through that, to access that, just like a gate there. And if we just use our senses or empirical inductive reasoning, we're not going to break that gate. We need to have reason to open up that gate, right, that epistemological gate, to access that epistemology of the truth, of the one. All right, All right let's move on, because I'm taking forever here now. Democritus, this is the last uh, pre-Socratics, and then we'll talk about the sophists. Democritus. So Democritus, really quickly, really important. Why? Ancient atomism. Just like Empedocles had ancient theory of evolution, this guy, about 2,000 years ago, thought about the world as being made up of these tiny, indivisible little bits of material they called atoms. And these atoms, they combine and they disperse to create and to decay life. That's how life comes and dies, because little bits of, little bits of matter called atoms combine together to create a human being. And when I die, those atoms just decay and disperse, and they go back into the earth or back into something else to create a tree or create a bird or something else. But everything is made up of these atoms, these tiny little atoms. Um, and they move rapidly, right? These, these atoms are in this void, right? And this, this hyperion type thing, right? This, this, the one. And this is, so there's like this hyperion, this logos, this, this one, like background material stuff. And these atoms move all rapidly around there, and they collide, and they combine to create life. Or they disperse, and they create death. Right? That's Democritus, this ancient theory of atomism. Of course, when the Christian do, we lost this, we lost this stuff here in the medieval times when the Christianity became the authority of philosophy, and they practically tried to destroy this ancient atomism. It completely goes against the creation story of Christianity. Another important thing about Democritus is his distinction between the, or his idea of the void. Void means nothing. But for him, it's not just nothing. It is something. It's just, it just has nothing in it, right? It's not the same as nothing. Right? To hear the void is a space that does not contain objects or things, but it nevertheless is, is something. This is the void, right? Think about the Aperion, or Logos, right? Going on the same kind of strand there, just a different kind of term and a different kind of uh, conceptualization of that, this, this, this void. And out of this void, these atoms kind of just flow around everywhere crazily. And they, they vary in size and shape and organization, and that's what gives rise to different life forms, right? different configurations of these atoms 
give different life forms. Right? So for Democritus, the world is mechanistic. It's like a machine. Kind of, it has it has different nature has different certain configuration it's going to fall into. Okay, nature makes them happen that way. And what's really cool about Democritus is that this basic insight about that matter is made up of these fundamental indivisible units, right, whether it's quarks or electrons or atoms, right, is yet to be refuted. We still use that idea, right? Now it's more precise and more fine-grained, but that basic idea that matter is made up of these indivisible, indivisible little units, we still use that today. All right, let's move on to the sophists. Right, so Protagoras and the Sophists. This is the last section of this long ass fucking chapter. I just get so excited about talking to this stuff. And then, you know, I'm sure like you guys, if you are quarantining, you're all by yourselves and stuff. So when I have a chance to talk, I get all excited, right? So bear with me, y'all. So Protagoras and the Sophists. Mm. So Pythagoras is one of the most famous of the sophists, and what the fuck is a sophist? You might be asking yourself now. A sophist, uh, in today's world, it has a really bad uh, connotation. A sophist is one that indulges himself in sophistry. And sophistry is just uh, this, uh, using rhetoric, uh, using emotional persuasion, uh, even argumentation, logic, not to find the truth, but to get your own way, to persuade. So remember, in our last lecture, we made a distinction between persuasion and argumentation. Uh, the sophists, all they care about is not the truth, not, not, not arguments for the, for the sake of the truth, but arguments and, and persuasion, both together, and they use it masterfully. They're really masters at using these two, two things, arguments and persuasion, to get your way. Or like one of the sophists says, um, I, we can make the weaker argument stronger, right? So it doesn't matter about the truth, like philosophers care about. The sophists, they care about just getting your own way. It's about using logic and whatever means you have, really, rhetoric, right? Emotional persuasion, like ethos, pathos, right? All those things to get your own way, right? To uh, apply these things, apply philosophy, the tools of philosophy for practical means to benefit your own person, right? In ancient Greece, and ancient Athens, to be more precise, the sophists were these itinerant, these traveling professors. So back then, there were no schools, right? The very first school in Athens really was Plato's Academy, right? And if there was schools back then before Plato's Academy, not everybody had access to these schools, and they were really um, shitty, to say the least. So you had these people, these sophists, that would walk around, that would travel to Athens, and they would teach students, they would teach kids, right? Primarily uh, the the offsprings of the aristocrats of Athens, and they would teach them, and they would pay, and they would uh, charge a fee, right? It's like when you go to UTEP or to EPTC, or right? you go to a class, and then they charge you tuition, right? Sometimes it's pretty expensive, I might add, but that's the way we live. Uh, anyways. These guys they didn't have a school, so you, they will go to your house, or they will go to like uh, the park, San Jacinto Plaza down here, down the street here, and they would um, just talk and teach students, and then they would charge you a fee, all right? And they would, and what they would teach is a whole range of subjects, but the main thing they would teach is rhetoric and logic, really. So rhetoric is uh, the art of persuasion, whether it's written or spoken rhetoric right how you talk really depends on how you're going to get your way right if you go for example you go to a judge and you go out there on my mom like ah, I better go, fuck this fuck that or go talk to a cop like that right talk to a fucking cop like that you know they're going to fucking respond violently if you talk to a cop like oh yes sir no sir no you're wrong sir but you know what i understand sir or whatever they'll be a little bit more cool you know i'm not gonna lie all cops are you know, there's, there's going to be some reforms made, right? It's, we're going through a, a time period in our lives right now where we're reckoning that we need reformations with our police force, right? But it depends on how you talk to them, right? You could persuade them to get out of your out of a ticket, right? I'm sure many of you have tried to do this. We try to sweet talk your way out of a fucking ticket, right? 
I've tried it done many times too. It never works. I'm not a good, I'm not a good sophist at all. <laughs> Maybe because I'm just very, fuck you, right? Anyways, sophists, they teach you that. Right? How to persuade, how to be artful in persuasion to get your way. It's not about the truth, right? It's just about gaining your way, right? So they do uh, the, the art of verbal persuasion, right? Argumentation, laws, ethics, politics, history. They teach you all these ranges of subjects, not to learn history for history's sake, right, to learn the truth, but to use it as a weapon against your opponent when you're debating, right, to get your way. So there's very practical applications of these things, right? Very egoistic applications of philosophy. Right, so these are the sophists. All right, so the emphasis is on the practical applications of these things for self-improvement. Right? Not about the truth, just improve your own lot. Right? So it's not surprising that people like Socrates or Plato or Aristotle hated the sophists. Well, many people hated the sophists because they would use, they would put a bad name on philosophy. As a matter of fact, Socrates was called a sophist. And you could argue that he was put to death, executed, because he was he was thought of as a sophist, but he wasn't, because he would he would do the same thing. Socrates would walk around Athens and teach students, but he would never charge, and he was always only looking for the truth. He was not about your egoistic self improvement. It was just about searching the truth. The sophists were about just improving your own lot. But they were more or less the same thing. They were, they would do the same thing. There's different aims, okay? And also, according to Plato, the sophists. So one of the the sophists that Plato hated was Gorgias, right? And vice versa. Gorgias hated Plato, Socrates. Pretty cool. Uh, pretty cool relationship that they had. Right? They hated each other. They hated the fuck out of each other. Um, so according to Plato, right? Gorgias is wrong. Because the sophists believe in this thing called relativism. It's a really important concept. Relativism. Relativ relativism. Relativism. Relativism is this idea. Right? So every time you hear the word ism, it, it refers to an idea. Right? Capitalism, the idea of capital. Socialism, the idea of living in socially, so societies. And they share each other things. Communism, the idea of living in communes, right? So relativism is the idea that everything is relative, right? What does this mean? So let's use um, let's use, let's use morality for example, right? So if you're a if you're a relative moralist, right? A moral relativist. If you're a moral relativist. Your argument, your belief, is that morality is relative either to the individual or the to society or the community that, that the individual lives in. What does this mean? Let me clarify this further for you. It means that morality depends on what the individual thinks. This is called subjective relativism. So whatever you think is right is right. And whatever you think is wrong is wrong because it's relative to your subject, to the subject, to you, it's subjective to you, right? So if I think that uh, drinking beer at 10 in the morning is right, then I'll drink some beer. It's, not, it's water, by the way. But if you think it's wrong, then it's wrong. And both are right. Nobody's right or wrong, right? It's relativism, right? It depends on each person, right? Or let's take this to another notch, to what we called, um, what is it called? Cultural relativism. I gotta stop this lecture pretty soon. Cultural relativism. So it's relative to the culture. So if your culture says that killing people is okay, then killing people is okay. Right? Think about the Nazis back in 1930s Germany. Right? For them, it was it was law. It was the law to kill Jews and gypsies and homosexuals and mentally mentally. In, and mentally uh, incapacitated people as well. That was the law, right? Because they want to, right? Eugenics, whatever they believed in, right? That's what Hitler ordered, and Hitler was the Führer, 
and that was the law. Right? Go kill here. Gotta kill Jews. Exterminate the Jews. Right? So if you're a cultural relativist, that is fine. That's morally okay. Because that's their culture. It's relative. Morality is relative to their culture under this view here, under this idea right, of relativism. And that's what the Sophists espoused. Right? They didn't care about objective truth. They just care about manipulating arguments to fit their own needs. Right? So everything is relative to their own self-improvement. And Plato and Socrates and Aristotle hated that idea. Right? Philosophy was to find the truth, not to use it for some egoistic means. Right? And, and this is where we have now this, this idea of relativism right, that comes up from the sophists. Right? Whether it's based on a person, where you, you decide you call the shots, what's good, what's wrong, or what's right, what's, what's true, what's what not true, or whether it's your culture, where you come from. So it's either subjective relativism or cultural relativism. Right. Uh, Protagoras, right? He's, he famously said, one of his most famous quotes, man is the measure of all things. This is exactly what relativism espouses. You are the measure of all things. If it's right or wrong, you decide, not some objective truth out there or some authority. It's relativism. It's relative to me, or by society, my culture decides. Right? In other words, reality is what you believe it to be. This is what relativism kind of espouses. But there's some really um, backlash against relativism, especially moral relativism. So if it's personal, if it's subjective relativism, it means that you're infallible, that you're always right. That everything you do is always right. And that's impossible. Right? Nobody is infallible. Nobody is never wrong. Some we make mistakes. That's how we learn by right? making mistakes very often. Right? So this personal infallibility is absurd. It's 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 impossibility. It's impossible to be perfect. Never make a mistake. Right? And relativism supports that. So that, that, that it is possible, right? That's really what it, it defines. That's the definition of relativism, of subjective relativism, is that the person decides what's right or wrong, which implies and then that person should, it's infallible, and so he's always right, because right? they decide what, what's reality, right? Um, apply, you could apply this notion of infallibility to cultural relativism, right? If your culture is always right, right, is that possible, right? I think about uh, reformers, social reformers, right? So there's a lot of people protesting against police brutality and the institution of police itself, right? Um, and rightly so, right? It is pretty, it is pretty unjust. It is pretty archaic. Right? We're living in 2020. We're still using like you know methods from shit. God knows when, right? Jailing, right? People have health issues, right? Addiction, we put them in jail instead, right? Just there's some fundamental problem there that we, we're having still today, right? But these people that are protesting right now for a better world, right? Under a relativist approach, they're always going to be wrong. Doesn't matter what you protest against, because your culture where you live in is always right. So people like Gandhi. Right, that we held in so high esteem, or Martin Luther King, even, right, that we even have a holiday for him, right, nonviolence, right, civil rights movement leader, right. According to relativism, they were wrong, they were morally wrong because they were going against their own culture, and according to cultural relativism, the culture is always right. That's troubling, right? That's kind of. You know, it's a paradox. Or there's some issue there, right? Cultures are not all. I mean, for example, if you're a cultural relativist, you cannot critique and say that slavery was wrong back in 1860 or 1845, right? When in the U.S. slavery was legal back then. Now we know that that society back then, 
the US, United States societies, right, Anglo-American society in, before 1865, that was wrong, right? Slavery is wrong. But back then, that was right. A cultural relativist cannot make a judgment here. They're going to have to say, well, they were right because that was their culture, and I believe in my own culture. Right? You cannot make a judgment here. So the good thing about relativism is that it is tolerable, right? It does espouse tolerance, supposedly, right? You know, if everybody says, like, oh, well, if you believe that and I believe this, then nobody's wrong then. That sounds kind of cool, right? Like it's, it's tolerance, right? Everybody lives their own thing to let and let be, right? But look at the other flip side of re relativism or moral relativism is moral objectivism. So the flip side of relativism is objectivism. That means that there is one straight objective truth. And that's what everything depends on, just one universal truth. It's not about cultures or individuals, it's just everybody should follow this one law, right? This is objectivism, right? And moral objectivism, at first glance, they seem they seems intolerant. Right? They're not, they're not going to tolerate differences between cultures. They've got to follow this one rule. Right? But what if your rule is tolerance? What if your objective rule is to follow toleration, to be tolerant? Relativism cannot give you that rule. Relativism, as a matter of fact, as Plato argues, defeats itself. It's self-defeating. Right? So according to Protagoras, every all, uh, man is a measure of all things. So according to relativism, this view, if I see, if I say that murder is wrong, that killing is wrong, and you say it's right, they're, we're both right under relativism. I'm right and you're right because it's relative to the person right, in this case here. There's something wrong with that, right? Murder is murder, right? There's something wrong with murder, right? Um, if I think, right, so let's take this relativism further. If I think that relativism is wrong and you're a relativist, you must say that I'm right and that you are wrong because I'm saying relativism is wrong. But you're a relativist, so you must accede, or you must give me, and say that I'm right too, that I'm also right. You guys get that? So if, relativ if relativism says that whatever anyone believes is just as true as what anyone else believes, so if someone claims that relativism is wrong, then that should be true too. Right? And that can't be true if you believe that relativism is right. Right? It's, it's, I really hope you guys get this. This is on page 49, um, 47 to 49, right? So that how relativism defeats itself. So relativism says everybody is right. If everybody is right, and I believe that relativism is wrong, and you just said everybody is right, then I'm right. Relativism is wrong. So relativism does defeat itself. Okay. All right. That's the end of this longest fucking lecture. But anyways, uh, I just want to uh, point to you to uh, keep up with the discussion boards. Y'all doing a great job. All right, you have two two questions to answer for chapter two this time. All right. What is the the pre-Socratic's greatest contributions. Just tell me what they contributed to philosophy, okay? And then subjective relativism, what I just talked about. Do you think it's true or do you, do you don't think it's true? Okay. So, all right. So, again, thank you so much. You guys stay safe. And we'll see you next time for Chapter 3.